In this video, we're going to talk about the axioms and mechanics, which are the starting point to develop the governing equations that we use to analyze mechanical systems. These axioms are the starting point whether we want to derive the differential equations covered in Module 3 or the integral relations covered in Module 5. I will also introduce two different frames of reference, the Lagrangian and the Eulerian frame of reference, and present the starting point for the two important equations covered in Module 3. An axiom is a statement that we make that we take or assume to be true, and then explore the consequences that follow from that truth. In mechanics, almost all of the important axioms are conservation principles, the one exception being the second law of thermodynamics. We have conservation of mass, conservation of linear momentum, which is often just referred to as conservation of momentum. We have conservation of angular momentum, which is just the moment of that linear momentum, conservation of the moment of linear momentum. We have conservation of energy, which is also known as the first law of thermodynamics. And of course, we have the second law of thermodynamics. Conservation of mass. The most basic axiom of mechanics is that of conservation of mass. Basically says that mass can neither be created nor destroyed, and therefore it is a conserved quantity. This axiom also gives us a chance to think a little bit more about what axioms are. When Einstein discovered that mass could be converted into energy through nuclear reactions, we had to adjust our axiom to account for these reactions that do consume mass. We still enforce the axiom that mass is conserved, we simply can choose to add a term to account for the mass that is converted into energy. In this course, however, we'll not consider nuclear reactions, and so for our purposes, the total system mass itself is conserved. Mass is the fundamental basis of our system of mechanics, and the additional conservation principles describe conservation of additional properties of the masses that we choose to consider. Conservation of momentum. If a mass is moving, it has linear momentum, which is simply the product of a mass and a velocity. And since velocity is a vector, linear momentum is also a vector. Conservation of linear momentum is an axiom that states that linear momentum is conserved, and it is a law with which you are probably very familiar. But perhaps you haven't thought about it in these terms before. This principle is simply Newton's second law, F equals ma. Conservation of angular momentum. We can also take moments of the momentum that our mass has and make an axiom that angular momentum, or the moment of momentum, is conserved. Conservation of energy is the axiom that states that the energy of a system, the energy of the mass that we're considering, can neither be created nor destroyed, except, of course, in the case of nuclear reactions. But we're not going to consider those in this course, and so we can carry on with such a statement. And finally, the second law of thermodynamics. It's the one axiom which is not a conservation principle, and it states that the entropy of a mass system will always increase or stay the same, that it cannot decrease. It is an extremely important law, which tells us not just which processes are possible and which are not, but it can also be used to understand precisely how to improve a system, and even whether a given model of matter is appropriate to use or not. Let's begin with conservation of mass now. This is the starting point to define what our system is. We've probably been most used to describing a fixed mass system in the Lagrangian frame of reference. Let me explain what that is. Imagine a baseball, or perhaps an apple. It has a fixed mass, and we can do things with this apple. Perhaps we throw it through the air. We watch it as it moves through the air, and it traces out its parabolic arc. Perhaps it lands on the ground, bounces, and carries off on smaller arcs. As we watch this system, this system its mass is fixed, and as it moves from one point to another, we're watching that mass move, and we're looking at the velocity of that system and the position as it changes with time. That is the Lagrangian frame of reference, tracking the motion of that fixed mass system. And so, for many of the things that we've dealt with in mechanics, this has been the intuitive and natural frame of reference. In fluid mechanics, we very commonly use another frame of reference. Let me try and explain that. In the Eulerian frame, Instead of tracking the motion of the fixed mass over time, instead, we look at a fixed region in space, a defined region in space. That region of space may be moving itself. It may be changing size as well. But in the simplest case, it's a fixed 
region in space that is neither moving nor changing in changing size. If we go back to our system that we described in the Lagrangian frame and think about what that means in our Eulerian frame. The mass in the system right now, at this moment, is zero. The apple is moving towards my region that I'm defining, and now a portion of it has entered the volume. There's a certain portion of that apple that's in there, and therefore the mass of my, syst of my system described in the Eulerian frame is that portion which is in there. As the apple continues, it gets completely inside, and the full mass of the apple is in there, and then as it moves out the other side of my volume, the mass is again decreasing down to zero. Likewise, when the apple is not in my volume, or in my region of space, the velocity in my volume is zero. As soon as part of the apple enters, I can define a volume in there, and that may change as the apple moves through, and certainly there will be no velocity defined again once the apple has left the volume. Likewise for momentum, when a portion of the apple is inside my volume, there's a small portion of the mass inside there, it has a, a velocity, and so the product of that portion of the mass which is inside and the velocity is momentum which is in that system. It will increase to a maximum, <coughs> at least the mass portion of it will increase to a maximum, and decrease again to zero when the apple leaves. Thinking about this fixed region of space, and what's happening as my apple moves through it, is thinking about that same system in the Eulerian frame of reference. And while it may not seem completely intuitive, if we think about it in another way, you'll probably find that it actually is. Think about the air in this room. <clears throat> it would be very difficult to track the air in this room like I tracked the apple, and think about what's happening as the air moves from one part of the room to another part of the room. But we can think about the velocity at any point in this room. If we pick any one point, we can measure the velocity, and that velocity is being is the result of air particles moving towards that point, to that point, and away from that point. And we can likewise do that to every point in this room and get a map of the velocity in this room. That is an Eulerian description of the airflow in this room. Here we describe the governing equations in terms of a Lagrangian fixed mass system, which has momentum, angular momentum, and energy, and entropy, and we'll have to convert them to an Eulerian frame of reference for all the work that we do with them in this course. The tools for doing that are the material derivative for the differential equations we derive in Module 3, and the Reynolds transport equation for the integral equations that we derive in Module 5. Let's talk a little bit more about conservation of mass. First, we have to define our system. System is defined by the mass that makes up the system, and conservation of mass says it's the same mass for all time, and of course the mass of our system is not changing, mass is conserved. So we can write the mass of our system is equal to a constant. And we're going to want to be deriving differential equations, so we can take the derivative of our system mass, and of course the derivative of our system mass with respect to time, is the derivative of this constant, which is equal to zero. There we have our first differential equation, the derivative of our system mass, with respect to time, is equal to zero. Next, let's talk about conservation of linear momentum, or Newton's second law. Newton's second law, we recall, tells us that the sum of the forces, which are vector quantities, acting on our system, is equal to that system mass, times the acceleration of that system, which is also a vector quantity. And we again want to get, get to differential equations, and so we can describe the system mass as the time rate of change of the velocity. Here we have our velocity vector and the derivative of that dv dt. And because our system mass is constant, we can move it inside that derivative, and we can write that the derivative of our system mass times the velocity with respect to time is equal to our sum of forces. In addition, we're going to want to talk about things per unit volume. So if I divide my forces by the volume, the volume that my system has, I will get the forces per unit volume. I can simply say the sum of the forces divided by the volume, and why don't I give that another symbol? We'll call it a lowercase f, which we'll use to symbolize forces per unit volume. Then when I divide the other side, the left, the right hand side, 
by the system volume. The mass of the system divided by its volume gives me the density. So I can see that that is then the derivative of the density times the velocity with respect to time. And this will be the starting point for deriving conservation of linear momentum.